Hi, good morning. Thanks very much for having me here today. Uh, I want, I have a finite amount of time today. That's it. This is, I don't know if I can my schedule. So we're going to, I'm going to speak for a relatively short amount of time so I can take as many questions from you as possible in the time we have together. So many of you know, as I've worked with you for many cases for many, many years, that I'm a huge believer in neighborhood Texas. That when I was on the city council, I started neighborhood councils before the charter required it. And on the council, I led the city's effort to propel charter reform forward and worked very hard to ensure most of, most of the role for neighborhood councilors in the charter. And then in at least one of the neighborhood councils in my district, the South Robertson Neighborhoods Council, I said, no, 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 no. I, I said to them early on that I wanted to experiment and provide meaningful land use authority to them over key decisions within their area. I, I, I wanted to find a way when I was first starting the neighborhood council effort in my district and in the city as a member of the council to show neighborhoods that it really matters if you choose to engage in improving quality of life in your community. I'm not a big fan of meetings for the sake of meetings. I am a fan of trying to identify concrete changes that we can make together to show people the value of community engagement. I'm a big believer in getting people from across a wide spectrum of positions involved in neighborhood decision making. And now as I ran for city attorney, I spoke before many of your neighborhood councils. And we talked about the importance of neighborhoods to my campaign, and now neighborhoods in effectuating the most important goals in the city. There needs, there needs to be a deep connection between the city attorney and neighborhood councils on many levels. You're probably aware that I am focused on revitalizing the neighborhood prosecutor program. Why? Because it's a way for the city attorney's office to connect to specific goals of neighborhood councils and clergy and small business and schools and parents in a neighborhood so we can show you that the intervention of the justice system made a big difference. Whether it's making sure kids can walk to school safely or getting rid of this nuisance or focusing in a much more effective way on code enforcement, a whole array of issues that we need to do together. Now, I, as I said, I don't want to speak for very long, but I want to give you a little glimpse as to what's happening now. So, as the city attorney-elect, I'm very respectful of the fact that I'm not the city attorney yet, and Mr. Gutanich and I have forged a very good relationship as we move forward with the transition. But in the meantime, I am myself forming a transition team, and we're going to soon set about to work. And I want you to know that among the key priorities I will be tasking my transition team to focus on is this neighborhood piece neighborhood prosecutors, forging close and effective ties with neighborhood councils, looking at the issue I mentioned earlier of safety in and around school sites, and a lot more. Uh, and I'm going to pause there. We can talk about anything you want. I really want this to be as responsive a moment as I can offer to you. But it's just a moment. We're going to have a lot more work together. Again, some of us have history that goes back to the mid-1990s. For those of you, I'm a new person. You may have voted for somebody else. That's cool. At this time, we need to unify in a city that will only be the best it can be with our partnership. So let me pause and take your questions. If I love I, I, I and see if just one second to say that I know that I am at a stage now where I have a lot to learn, including about the nitty-gritty of the office, let alone about a specific priority in a given neighborhood. If I know an answer, I will tell it to you as directly as I can. If I don't know, I will find out. Please, take it. Well, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. I'm Cindy Clayton. I'm so to hug you. Yes, I know who you are. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for being in the Congress of 2011 and 2012. And we look forward to seeing you in 2013. Me too. My question is really broad because I've been around the neighborhood council system for many years now. And what I, in my experience, see is um, dancing. Um, here we are in neighborhood councils trying to improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods. I'm happy to hear about the neighborhood prosecutor program, but I have some major issues that have been on the table and s that don't get fixed or that are going to continue to impact us. One being the relaxation of how the city planning department interprets 
uh, decision, their decision making in planning decisions, specifically SB 1818, that we can over, over impact our communities with dense development where it doesn't belong. The community care facilities ordinance where we have the nuisance of, of that. Existing LA municipal codes and um, uh, ordinances being misinterpreted. The AGF ordinance, which has never come, gotten finished in its over six years. The medical marijuana dispensaries. Here we have sites in our community to try to bring jobs and development and good uh, business to our community, and we have, you know, bars on windows and, and buildings left derelict. Anyway, I, I hear that you are, or the city attorney's function is to represent the city council. And so you're only really advising them on what they do. What can you do to emphasize these big, these are some high, hot topics that will help us as we move forward to improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods? Great, okay. So there is obviously no way for me to go through that list and answer each of the uh, challenges you've raised. But let me talk in general terms for a second. It is imperative that we do everything we can to listen carefully to each other and then work together. I don't mean that as a platitude. So here's let me talk about how to express that. I anticipate spending meaningful time in your neighborhoods working with your neighborhood councils, not only with my staff, but myself. It's also the case, and this is really going to be more of the heart of your question, I think, that I as a city attorney need to be able to work closely with the city council members and the mayor to assure that when there's an idea that makes its way through the process, at the earliest stages, we avoid pitfalls. And that's where a lot of this partnership can come in. Those pitfalls can be, you know, legal issues, they can be neighborhood specific issues, but if I'm aware of them at an early stage and council members and the mayor trust me enough to be in at the initial stages of the process, we can figure out how to avoid stalling later on because we've worked those problems out at the beginning. As a lawyer, that's, I think, one of the most effective ways to practice. You work with your client early on, trying to identify potential hurdles and then circumvent those hurdles as you make your way through the process. Too often in the city, we've seen the opposite approach. Matters make their way through the city council, the mayor supports it, and then they stall. They stall because there hasn't been that process I described at the outset, and that's going to change. Now, I'm still working myself on figuring out what the best structure of the city attorney's office should be when it comes to these issues. For example, now there are basically two broad divisions in the office, civil and criminal. Well, there used to be an office of general counsel in the office, the essence of which was to assure timely response to departments and to the council on the getting through ordinances, that kind of thing. Is that structural change a good idea on that? Going back to where we were, so we can get to the heart of what you're talking about, which is keeping faith with voters. Maybe I'm looking at it. There are going to be specific expressions early on of how effective this teamwork can be. And you mentioned one of them off the bat, which is Measure D. You know, I don't know exactly what steps I want to take yet. I was elected last week. But I do know this, that neighborhoods have a big role to play when it comes to the implementation of Measure D. Because we have to identify even the sites that are going to be permissible under Measure D and how we enforce with regard to those sites that are. Those are neighborhood issues. So what you're hearing from me is some themes. So that means real precision. I mean, one of the issues that you mentioned. But the themes all boil down to an early, effective listening process by me so we can ensure an effective process of orientation at the end of the road. Yes. All right. Uh, my congratulations. Thank you. And, um, I'm Jack Rublad, uh, our leader of the council, community group oh, chair, wow. and a Panama City land use member. And I'm an architect, an advocate for transitory development, transitory communities, and transitory districts. So when we look at the, using the taxpayer, great payer money in Los Angeles efficiently, we, I personally want to uh, you know, shout out to the combination of the building and safety and planning. On the other hand, uh, the two departments have been separated. Now, great gloriously in the past. But, you know, neighbor councils have planning issues and they have building enforcement issues. And when you put the two interests together, it's hard to it's a blur. And maybe the city attorney can have an over horizon uh, radar out for how developers might take advantage of the situation. Okay. And, and let me, I'm just, I'm just to, I know there's not a, a real concrete question, and then let me a couple observations if I could. 
know, so first of all, you know, let me take a very specific problem that many of you have addressed. That's not actually a Jack and question, but it's used as an example. Uh, the problem of voluntary conditions and how they relate to the uh, actual analysis kept in the neighborhood. Who here doesn't know what I'm talking about? So, okay, so here's the issue. Oftentimes, there are some very specific agreements reached between the city of Los Angeles as a city with regard to mitigation measures for a project, for example, and a developer. There are, however, in addition to those, sometimes agreements reached between a neighborhood organization and a developer. And the developer says, you know, I will, beyond the scope of what the city requires as a voluntary matter, I would agree to perform the following five tasks and mitigations. And then the question comes later on, are those enforceable or not? And in general, the rule has been that it's tough to enforce many of those. And that breaks faith between a community and a developer, between a community and the city government. As city attorney, one step I need to take is providing very strong advice at the earliest stages to our planning staff to ensure that there is a tight nexus that they can establish between goals that the community has and what the developer is seeking to do. If you establish that nexus early on and the city's involved in, infor in, in creating conditions that can be enforced under city rules, you avoid the problem later on of potential lack of performance. With the, because there's no such thing as a voluntary condition that's enforceable. And people have been misled about that. By telling you a little bit about that particular issue, I hope you get some insight into how I want to be a city attorney. I want to avoid situations where at the end of the road, you say, what the heck? We thought X, Y, Z was going to be the case, and now it's done. You know, I didn't run to be the leader on medical marijuana enforcement. I am going to be the leader on medical marijuana enforcement because the voters expect it. Right? Because this is what I mean by that, right? So, you know, was that a key goal in line in the campaign? It was an issue. I had other issue goals as well, but because the voters chose to make that the rule of the city, I support a measure you, by the way, because they chose to make that the rule of the city, you can be darn sure that one of my top priorities is going to be to keep faith with you on making that law work. So, other questions? Amy was actually an academic council, but still involved on the eastern portion of the certain assembly district. We have a good part of your council, final uh, zoning. You know, Broadway's guy. Um, we still have, have a combo over there. Yeah. Uh, but the one issue that came up, um, we're finding in some cases where we're being played in our council meetings, in our committee meetings. And in particular, there was a, 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 a CUP um, uh, involved with a, a restaurant bar that made noise today. <coughs> the question that we're drafting, uh, some of the councils in the area, uh, and some of the other ones are, are sharing, I'm going to paraphrase briefly and informally for you tonight, uh, th th this morning. When in every council, well, once, once you read it, it's not very poor and formal. Go ahead. <laughs> if we are to find out in the course of the hearing that a, the, the uh, stakeholders that are present at the hearing have a lawsuit or insurance claim um, as, as part of the deliberations, um, what can we ask um, in, in regards to the people who are making that uh, uh, as to the, uh, the nature of the suit of the claim, the claimants, the amount of claim, the amount of uh, amount of loss? We had a deliberation. And the next day, after the day they complained about the, uh, uh, the restaurant, there was a settlement. And uh, we want to make sure we're not being played and we ask the right questions. Uh, so we're informed by what the uh, real motives are the people who are representing their, their, their state and their client. Okay, I'm not actually really sure I understand the question. We try to restate it and be sure that I do, okay? So are you saying you've been involved as a neighborhood council member in situations where there's a pending CUP and a group not you, is bringing a lawsuit with regard to some of the same issues that you're concerned about, then that group reaches a settlement with the proponent of the CUP, and you're not allowed to know what's in the settlement because it's confidential. How do you avoid that? Is that a question? Well, more particularly, while they are at our hearing, we're asking them, well, we now, we now know that you have a lawsuit about that. Um, knowing the nature of that lawsuit would allow us to better judge. Okay. So before it's worth in the filing, that's the great issue. The filing of a lawsuit and the content of that lawsuit is public information. And you don't even need to ask them. You can find it from court records. That's different from a settlement. Not always, but many times when there's a settlement that's negotiated, the terms of that settlement include a confidentiality provision. 
And that term is, in, is injected into that settlement because the parties have for many reasons. There's nothing that anybody after the fact can do to unwind that confidentiality. But if you're aware of a lawsuit on day one and anybody is recalcitrant, is not sharing with you the content of that, you can just find it out. Just go to the just find the court records, they're online. You, have, you can just get electronic. So I think there are some, some very practical ways to avoid the problem you're describing. But there is no way that I can suggest to you that you can, after the fact, insert yourself into someone else's settlement and make what is confidential public bad chance of public. Fair enough. Please. Hi, Mary Benson, formerly of the Hill Trails District in our neighborhood council, you have uh, the city attorney representing the city in a $650,000 lawsuit against a developer who has been postponing final judgment for seven years in court. Um, and the city attorney has done a great job, I, I've got to say. But my question is, in order to avoid that, it had he been uh, issued a fine, a ticket, so to speak, uh, and now there's a proposal for active code enforcement that would reduce those issues to a misdemeanor where the developer didn't do something to be cited over and over again for violation. How do you stand on the ACE program? Is that great, something you're going to support? Great question. So again, just so we're all on the same page, who doesn't know the essence of the ACE program? Everybody okay we're all on the same page? Look, okay. So I'm a big supporter of that idea. I think it's important for us, and then this has languished for a long time. It's been kind of a pilot project and it's been limping along, right? I, I don't I cannot tell you as I stand here now with precision exactly how we're gonna jump start it, but a priority of mine is to make it work. And let me talk to you about ACE, and you happen to raise something indirectly that I want to talk to you about as well. I think that if a developer has violated rules along the way, that the developer should not be able to proceed until they rectify this is the situation in the first Right? That's actually, you know, and it's called the clean hands policy, right? You know, the city and the, the county has that rule in place. I want to see that rule in place in the city. And I know there's been some action taken to move along those lines. I want to bring that action to a conclusion. It's only right. As to code enforcement, when I was on the city council, I'm you know, the first city attorney ever to have served as a city council member. So I had the sense of a client's perspective as well in this process. When I was on the city council, I was frustrated too and began to explore the essence of the city, how to make these infractions as opposed to what requires a long court proceeding. Because there are thousands of code violations that go unenforced. There are two reasons why I think it's imperative that the city find a more efficient way to enforce codes. The first reason is the intrinsic value of the violation that's at stake in rectifying that. Right, these are often small things, sometimes they're more consequential, and they erode a quality of life in neighborhoods. So that's the first most important reason. There's a second reason too. If you see the city incapable, apparently, of enforcing rules that exist, you lose faith in city government. And that's a bad thing. I mean, I don't pretend, I was saying, we were all this cute once, but some of us maybe not really ever that cute. Um, so the, um, I, it's all, I've been upstage many times, just so you know, so it's all right. Um, won't be the first time here. But I, I wanted to say, I think that there is, at the heart of your question, a much deeper issue. And that is, cities, I don't pretend that government can solve everybody's problem. It can't. It shouldn't. But unless government is deemed to be an effective partner with you and actually gets things done, you won't want to engage anymore. Why should you be part of a process that doesn't ever get anywhere? That's the antithesis of how the city should work. The reason I wanted to create neighborhood council back in the 1990s is I wanted to demonstrate that it matters to get involved. That but for you, things wouldn't be as good as now they are. And people will be inspired to work together. That's a key why code enforcement is so important. Let me give you another example. And I don't want to take one, this other question, but I want to say one more thing about, about another iteration of the same problem that I care a lot about. In the state legislature, I was a joint author of the Homeowners' Bill of Rights. When I ran that set of legal service, you know, I used to run a public interest law firm. When I ran that set of, we were very focused on trying to prevent people from losing their houses, mostly someone's grandma, losing a house to scam rights. I'm really into the issue of foreclosures and the blight that they cause when lenders don't maintain properties. And as I walk door to door in many of your neighborhoods, from Van Nuys to South Los Angeles, 
People told me about, look at that house over there. No one is fixing it up. It's foreclosed. Look over here, and I, I was very concretely, I was talking, I was on the street in an area south of downtown, and a minister approached me in front of one such house who recognized me. And the minister said to me, how do you think our kids feel walking by this blighted property that's been foreclosed upon them, is not being maintained on their way to school every day? You know, about their neighborhood, about their quality of life. And by the way, drugs could be the sensitive places. Bad things happen. And then he saw me two weeks ago or so, and he said to me, by the way, that building burned down. You know? What's happening in the neighborhood? You know how many fines have been imposed pursuant to the city's ordinance that requires lenders to maintain their foreclosed properties in two years? How many fines would you guess? Zero. Right. What does that tell a community? I know what it tells a community. It says, why should I bother to vote? Why should I bother to care when the city can't do this? One of the key reasons I ran to be your city attorney is to change that. There are so many, and I couldn't see it above beyond your questions, there are so many examples of the same kind of problem that exists in the city. And there is no way I'll be able to be an effective leader in changing this without you. No way. Because almost all these issues are neighborhood specific issues. That's why I'm here now. This was not a convenient morning for me, I can just tell you. I